Ready. Play. The men's single semi-finals, I should add. Um, before we do that, I think we've got to give a quick mention to the bees uh, that we saw last night. I mean, Steve, how, how long have you been covering tennis for? And have you seen anything like it? Uh, I've been covering for 50 years and been around it for 60 when go back to my days as a, uh, getting immersed in the game as a fan at the age of 12. Yeah. Uh, no, I've never seen anything like it. I thought what was wonderful about it was the, especially Carlos, the, the, he, he, the amusement he had, rather than get agitated and say, get rid of those bees, I need to play this match. This is ridiculous. Uh -huh. He kind of had that grin on his face. He's, you know, part of it is I think he's happy with how he's playing again, and he felt confident about this match. And the other was, look, there's nothing we can do about this, but this is amazing. I'm that, and he even said afterwards, it's something I'll never forget. And, and that was the right attitude. And Zara was a good sport about it, too. They knew that the, the, those people there were doing everything in their power to get them back to be able to resume the match. So, but no, I've never seen anything like it. It, it was, it was an incredible sight. Those bees swarming around. I, I worried about the fans too, sitting in the sands. I suppose it didn't seem to put in danger them, but I, there was, I, I worried about those spectators. I did too initially, although it did seem like the bees were attracted by two or three things uh, in the stadium and it wasn't actually within the stands itself. But yeah, I, I know what you mean. But I, once I saw that the fans were not being evacuated, I was like, OK, it seems to be a, a bunch of bees in, in certain areas. And when we all over the next couple of hours became experts in, in what bees are up to and why they're there. And, and then, of course, we were focusing on this guy, Lance, a lot. Uh, he got his yes. five minutes of fame, didn't he? He did. Uh, yeah, he enjoyed it. He was high-fiving people when he walked back into the stands. And yeah, I mean, I thought Carlos and, and, and Sasha were very, very appreciative of him and handled the situation very, very well because, I mean, it's a big match and you want to get on with it. And a lot, you, you understand rain delays, but you don't understand B delays. <laughs> yeah, right. Okay. That leads us in, though, to the fact that, that Carlos was the person on the court at least who uh, who dealt with the whole situation best and was just outclassed Sasha in pretty much every department. I, the best of my knowledge, I don't, don't think Carlos had to face a break point, no, which right. on, the, on this slow court um, uh, and his serve has been under scrutiny, I would say, in the last six months is, is pretty impressive. Um, and he just, yeah, he was just better than Svedev all over, right? Yeah, John, I didn't think... To your last point, I didn't think you're right. His serve was impressive, although the, the beauty of this court for him is it doesn't end up mattering that much. when he, If he's got full confidence in his ground game and he's, yeah. his ball control and patience is up to the level it was yesterday, then he doesn't necessarily, I think if the, the serve becomes more important on faster courts and different, different tournaments than this one. He, this reminds me of last year, the way he's starting to play right now, where he just was, it was probably his best, most efficient tournament of the year in many ways and starting to look like that now. Um, yeah, I thought he played an impeccable match. And in turn, here's Zarev, who's beaten him the last two times. He beat him in the year-end championships, beat him in Australia. Those were big wins. Mm -hmm. And he looked, I mean, it looked to me like the wind diminished his game. The wind in the slow court was just fatal to him. The yeah. wind, the slow court, and Carlos's excellence. It was just too much. It was a three-way, it just... It, th those three factors just destroyed him. And you could see how it was kind of a desultory performance from him, but you can see why he was almost fatalistic about it because he could see there was no way he was going to win on this day. He didn't have anything to hurt him with. It's been hard on all the players, by the way, because there have been so many cool days and cool evenings, slow courts, and then wind. The wind has picked up so much. In, that, that, that All of those things make it very hard for the players for player, it's it's harder to hold serve. It's just harder work. Period. I mean, Medvedev alluded to that it, after his win over over Hogaruna. It just that yeah. you know have to sort of just get the job done. In other words, you're not going to play beautiful tennis in these conditions. So, and yet, that's what I guess makes Carlos's performance all the more remarkable. Is he did, he did, he played spectacular tennis yesterday in a way that I haven't seen anybody else do in this tournament to that level. I mean, waiting for his openings, hitting those forehand down the line winners, 
obviously using his speed, his alacrity around the court was astonishing. And that was another thing that was showcased yesterday. You see a sense that the ankle is no issue anymore. And physically, mm -hmm. he's feeling 101%. So having said that, I'm still leaning 51-49 sinner, something yeah. like, you know, right down to the wire in that match. With not a lot of confidence, but I feel like Yannick having not lost all year and also understanding the, the importance of this rivalry to him right now and, and it will be a crucial rivalry for him over the next 10 years. So right now he really wants to cash in and exploit the fact that he's coming off a, a brilliant ending to last year, that he, since the middle of last year, he's been the better player. He's been better than Carlos. Carlos fell into a slump after Cincinnati. That's when, that's just when Sinner was starting to come round, the Great Fall, the Davis Cup, the Australian Open. So now, and he's beaten Carlos the last couple of times. Yeah. But this one becomes a particularly important meeting for both of them. What maybe hurts, Sin what maybe helps Carlos is he can feel kind of loose about it. He knows that most people are anticipating a Sinner win. Mm -hmm. uh, they're not giving it to him on a goal. The time possibly in this rivalry for the first time it's probably the yeah. expectation is on sinner yeah, exactly exactly so carlos may try to make that work in his favor on the other hand it's easy to feel that way going in they get into a tight match i think you you, you both players forget about that it's like you just want to find a way to win on this day there's so much at stake concerning the outcome of this contest for both players which makes it so much fun and i just can't imagine we get sort of a routine disappointing match i said it's always possible but the confidence that carlos has now the incentive he has sinner wanting to keep his unblemished year going it, it it's got all the ingredients to to be a, a great great tennis match i mean yeah as you say sinner's yet to lose and if he wins this match you know you'd fancy him going deep or possibly even uh, you know winning in miami i think even miami might be suited a bit more to yannick than indian wells but but the interesting dynamic about this rivalry is that as as i sort of said before i think before it's always been like if alcaraz absolutely brings it even though he does seem to bring the best out in yannick and i'm thinking about 2022 2023 um you just felt as though Alcaraz would probably end up winning. And, and, and it was probably Wimbledon. I remember I was at that match, the four setter in 2022. Uh, it was probably a year too early for Carlos on, on the grass. Uh, there was always kind of a, a, a thing. And then, okay, Carlos was facing match points in New York, but it was, again, there was this, there was this thing that we saw this Yannick Sinner on tour all year. And then we just see him really elevate his level and come alive against, against um, Carlos. And yet now, if Sinner brings his level, probably if he if he brings his level that he's produced all year, anything that I've seen from Carlos since Cincinnati is not going to probably be enough. I I agree with that. You know, with some reservations, it's just you know that it, Carlos seems to be peaking again. I just think that the big difference now from all of the, you alluded to so many interesting matches that they played that. You know, the 22 Wimbledon center wins and then Carlos escapes from match point down on his way to winning his, his U.S. Open title, his first major. And then they had a disappointing match last fall. OK, it's going to happen once in a while. That, that great scrape in my they played last Miami year. Miami semifinal, in, yeah. Yeah, exactly. But and they, India Wells semifinal. Huh? India Wells. And then, the, then Miami was a great match. The center one where Carlos was cramping. Yeah. I I just feel like. The big difference, the reason I still just lean that ever so slightly to Sinner is I think his serve is so much better since since he changed it mm -hmm. technically uh, over these over the over the last several six months. Let's say I think his serve is yeah. much better. So therefore, Carlos, who's got a great return, is going to be more hard pressed to break. And and even and then just the way. and he just i don't feel he misses as much in the rallies either everything he's tightened everything up there's no hole left i i think and in the end i think carlos could maybe <clears throat> i could see there were some of the matches that he won against sinner where i felt like he could he could coax some errors there were going to be a few little bad patches from from yannick i i don't think that happens now so carlos to me has to play 
you know, maybe one of the best matches of his career to win. But on the other hand, I'm not shocked if he does it. Because mm. right now I think he's feeling it again. That's what makes this so intriguing, is that he's feeling like the old Carlos and feeling like someone who feels he's ready to, to go to an even higher level. And he's also, he like Djokovic, you meant, we were talking about how Novak wants those, he relishes those rivalries and those, like he had going with Carlos and they may resume it. And I think Carlos is the same way. He feels yeah. like this sinner robbery is going to be one of the defining uh, aspects of his career. You know, he, he, uh, he has enough respect for Sinner to know they could go back and forth a lot through the years, that it's never going to be a foregone conclusion. They're always going to push each, push each other to the hilt. So you have that, too. I, I feel like, you know, as I said, I just can't imagine it's not very tight. Uh, I, I think that Carlos, there won't be many breaks either because Carlos, I ex expect to back up his serve as well as he had, has up until this stage of the tournament. Sinner, the thing about Sinner, I don't, tell me how you feel, John. Mm -hmm. I, I feel like, okay, he's not as flashy. He's never going to be the same crowd pleaser that Carlos is. But then again, nobody can match Carlos for charisma on the court and crowd pleasing characteristics. The, the ultimate shot maker. But Yannick is stingy. Now, Yannick is at that stage now where he does not want to give much away. Yannick is the ultimate, is one of the, is the ultimate professional right now, along with, I, I mean, you, you just feel like he's as dedicated to his profession as anybody out there right now. And he's thinking like a champion and he's, and he's just shored up any of any of the old, whatever minor weaknesses he had, I think are gone now. You just simply have to play an extraordinary match to beat him. So I, I, not as flashy, but in the end, maybe he just makes fewer mistakes. And he play, and then of course, as usual, it will come down to which one of these guys is is better on the big points, who rises to the occasion on the on the most important points of the match. But I wouldn't, I wouldn't, I don't think Sinner will be found wanting in that category either. I've circled a couple of things on my on my little notepad here while you're sort of putting that to me. And uh, you're not going to like one of them because one of the things I circled was pull the trigger uh, when it comes to Yannick. And, <laughs> and it, uh, but the other one is kind of elated, which is waiting for his openings, which is actually what you mentioned about Carlos. And I was thinking back to a year ago when actually in that Indian Wells tournament but especially in the final against Medvedev we all remember uh the serve and volley thing that he did then but also I think he was just waiting for his chance and taking it but I don't think there's anybody on tour right now uh definitely not Carlos and and and, and probably not Novak that uh, right now that's actually better at waiting for that moment and then pulling the trigger because you know, I think of the winner on match point in Australia, but I also think about the winner against Novak in the semi final. In fact, I counted uh, his match points. I was go just focusing on his match points in Australia, and he hit a lot of winners, and a lot of them were on the forehand side. It was something like four out of seven finished that way. It, it might have just been a quirk, but it was just like Yannick just knows exactly. He doesn't pull it too soon, not not that often now. Like you said before, in the past, maybe a few cheap points would go the way of his opponent, but now it's like he's just got that timing in every sense of the word uh perfectly. And i think the forehand i just feel like the forehand is, is much better than it was i used to yeah. feel like it could let him down at, at critical moments i remember against rafa and the french open and uh, uh, other instances where i felt like zarev at the u.s open where he was where it would start to fly in and where you felt like it wasn't holding up well under pressure that's just not the case right now so you really have to you have to beat him. Uh, but I think Carlos is in the mood and in the mode right now where he's going to be um, it's it's going to be similar on his side of the net. These guys are going to have to really earn it against each other and they and they know that going out there. I suspect that Darren Cahill will have a few ideas too for Sinner, you know, because he's seen so much of Carlos not only in his coaching role but in the television booth that mm -hmm. The scouting, I think, will come in very handy. Not, not, to, not, not to diminish Juan Carlos Ferrero. He'll have his own ideas on how to get uh, Carlos prepared for this match. I do hope, from Carlos's, from Carlos's standpoint, John, that he doesn't lean too much. He hasn't had to this tournament. He's been playing well since the, dropping his first set of the event. Since yeah. that time, he's played quite well. But 
I hope he doesn't lean too much on Juan Carlos during the match. I hope there's not too much okay. bad because we've we've seen that in the past and where I think it kind of got him into trouble. I, okay. I, I feel like it's it's not healthy for him. It, it's better for him to do some to do some of the thinking on his own and be a little more selective about looking over to Juan Carlos for encouragement or advice. So that'll be important too. While you notice with Cahill, you feel like Yannick looks over again. He's judicious about it, and he waits for big moments. And Cahill will shake the fist at him or yell something tactical. But it's much more. It's more limited. It's not yeah. as free. That'll be another interesting part of this contest. But it's obviously it's gonna. It, it it couldn't end up being. I mean, we saw an incredible final that you alluded to a few minutes ago with Sinner and Medvedev, the Australian final, and the, yeah. Yannick's climb back from two sets down. This mm -hmm. may end up being the best the best match we've seen it may end up being one of the best matches of the year i hope i'm not uh getting my hopes up too high and expecting too much but i can't see it any other way uh, i just ca cannot because i think they're both so prime for the occasion it's gonna have the feeling of a final don't you think yes i do it does feel like a final before the final in many ways and we will, uh, of course, be touching on Medvedev, Tommy Paul in, in a moment. Uh, one final thing that basically supports your your um, argument about the serve with Yannick, and, and even I was surprised by this at one point during the match with Lehetska yesterday, when Lehetska had one or two chances, was a bit loose on a few forehands that went long, and I think there can be some encouragement there that, that, that Carlos can take, but the serve, he's dropped serve, Yannick once in this entire tournament, yeah. which, you know, he's not dropped a set, but he's also only lost his serve once, which on these sort of slow, gritty conditions, I know people, one or two people have been suggesting they might be a bit quicker this year, but that's mightily impressive. Yeah, no, it is. It is. And it's reminiscent of Australia, where I believe he dropped it twice prior to the match against Daniel in the finals. And okay. obviously changed there, but no, it, it, and this was never the case with him in the past. It's, it's really ample proof of just how much that serves improved. Also, the way he handles pressure because he's very calm on break points. It's so routine to him now. He's face, he just does not get flustered, and he seems to raise his game almost every time. So he's forcing the other guy to come up with something extraordinary to, to break him on, 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 at those pivotal moments. So that's a good stat you just brought up. And flustered uh, is another word that I've written down and then quickly circled because I do think in the last seven or eight months that is something that's happened to Carlos on when he's facing big points. And he's admitted it in his, in his, in his words to the press. I think it was just on the eve of the tournament in Indian Wells. He said that he has he does feel a bit more nervous now than he used to on when he's sort of 15, 30 down or or he's got a break point opportunity in, and realizing, OK, this is big. Um, and I think that was good for Carlos to sort of just get that off his chest, you know. Um, and perhaps that has helped him clear his head. Okay. But, still, but John, don't you think it still gets back in this case to the fact that he has that he's in the, he's in the right state of mind and he knows yeah. that there's so much sinner talk. Uh, yeah. I, exact opposite, by the way, despite the fact that he'd lost to him at Wimbledon in 2022, when he played him at the open, everybody was kind of, we all were thinking this was going to be the Carlos moment. This was the yeah. breakthrough. This yeah. was going to be his first major. So he felt, he had to feel a certain amount of tension, and Sinner was the one trying to come at him as the underdog. And yeah. I think Carlos will enjoy that. That doesn't mean that he's automatically going to produce under pressure, but I think it, 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 it will allow, it will free him up to a degree, I, I believe. Fingers crossed. Okay. Yeah. Uh, the other semi final. We have this expression in English about the Lord Mayor's show, but I'm not, I don't think it's familiar in the US. It's basically when you have what I've described as potentially the final before the final. And I, I don't know, I was wondering about this about an hour ago before we spoke about the scheduling. I've got a hunch, not much more than that, that they'll go for Carlos Sinner first um, and then Medvedev Paul second. I think with one eye on European audiences, but also it's a Saturday, so they don't need to shift the bigger match to the evening or the later in the day slot. So I think with the European audience thrown in as well, um, you know, getting it a bit earlier in the day in California, I wouldn't be surprised if we have Cinema Alcaraz first. But whatever order they fall in, this after the Lord Mayor's show is, is basically like, you know, the big party happens, the eagerly anticipated thing, and then we get Daniel Medvedev against Tommy Paul. Um I obviously I hope that both matches are, are, are crackers. What are your thoughts on this encounter? 
Tommy Paul, of course, as you as you know so well, John, he took advantage of that nice opening in the draw. He was going to have to play Novak in the round of 16. Instead, it was Nardi. He got yeah. the job done. Then he plays Rude. Nice win over Rude in a tight three-set yeah. match. So he's confident. He's kind of he's he's had a good year all around since Australia. Disappointing yeah. loss to Exmanovic in Australia. Since then, he's buckled down. He's won a tournament. He's really he's rolling along nicely. He I think we'll try to attack as much as possible. He's been very, he's been happy with how, he, with his transition game and his volleying and, and talked a lot about watching tapes of Edberg and how much he loves Edberg's back end volleys. He's trying to be, become more aggressive and he's certainly going to have to do that because he's not going to wear Daniel down from the baseline as good as Tommy is. And he's terrific from the baseline. Mm. I mean, and we saw him beat Carlos last summer and then mm -hmm. have another close match with Carlos after that went, yeah. but that was a different kind of tennis, and and he was able to feel like in the longer rallies he could he could coax errors from Carlos. Be much more difficult to do that with Daniel. Definitely. So I feel like Tommy can make it interesting. Tommy can make it relatively close. I just can't see him beating Medvedev. Medvedev looks very disciplined to me. I think he did a great job to turn the tables on Corda on a very cold, windy night where I believe there were 15 service breaks across three sets. Yeah. And he, he managed to uh, win that match. And Korda, of course, had beaten him in Australia. And then again, one more time after that. So he recently, he'd struggled with Korda. It was a good effort. I thought the Runa match in miserable conditions. They both played scintillating tennis, uh, all things considered. And Daniel yeah. came out top and straight. Uh, so I like his chances. I think, you know, he's a... He's bounced back very nicely. He had the loss to Umber, but coming in here, but he's looked good here. And he's he's confident. I just feel like he believes that's that match is in his hands as good as Tommy Paul is. So I could I see something along the lines of say a four and six for Daniel, something like mm -hmm. that. Maybe Tommy squeezes a set, but I can't see Tommy winning the two sets. I, I like Medvedev. To, to meet Sinner or Alcaraz in the final. And I, obviously, uh, I'm, I'm picking Sinner. So I, I, I see a repeat of the Australian Open final. I, I think, frankly, oddly, Daniel would prefer that. I don't think he, he would, want, would want any part of playing Carlos on this same yeah. slow court where he yeah. got demolished last year. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, that was a U.S. Open. That U.S. Open win for Daniel was an, impressive and it was inspired yeah. and he caught Carlos at the right time and played his best tennis, but then he, he didn't do that well against him in the year-end championships. So granted, a meaningless round-robin match in Turin, but still not a great performance. It looked like Carlos once more had his number. So mm -hmm. if Daniel to play him on this court, I don't like it. I think he does better against Sinner than he, than he would do against uh, Carlos. That's my feeling. But I certainly expect to see Medvedev in the final. Yeah, because despite those... Those four in a row losses that he's had to Yannick, some of them have been mighty, mighty, mighty close. Oh, they one, have. Point, one point yeah. either way. And we could be looking at an 8 2 head to head rather than 6 4. Uh, regarding Tommy Paul, um, uh, when you were mentioning about him maybe having a slightly different mindset, talking about the Edberg uh, backhand volley and also the method of, of attacking. I, I was starting to just think about some of the semifinals he's had in the past um, in Canada and notably in Australia last yeah. year when, when he comes up against Novak. And there were one or two occasions in that match when I was like, you've, you've got to do something a bit different here, Tommy, because if you're going to be playing from the baseline and just doing these rallies against, you know, the, the greatest of all time, especially in this dynamic, um, you're not going to win this tennis match. You might as well go down 2-1-2 and, and, and do something different. Um, and I and I, I I hope that perhaps he does that differently as well against Medvedev because I think you're right he could easily just fall into this spell with Daniel in in a sort of backhand cross court rally scenario and then Daniel just pulls the trigger down the line and and that's that. Um, well, the other thing, John, don't you think they're just sorry to interrupt? He'll, no, no, it, perfect. It, it won't be that easy. In other words, Tommy's talked about how he feels in this tournament, unlike sometimes in the past where he his ground game was his greatest strength. He feels like it, it's been the attacking that's been the best part of his game and maybe his okay. ground game. So, I mean, he's, granted, thinking more that way, serving better than he used to. I just feel like in the end, Daniel's got just a little too much for him. Also, Daniel, my point about, to get back to what you were saying, Daniel will make it hard for Tommy to attack. Daniel keeps the ball so deep. 
and he passes so well as it moves so well. I just feel like all things being equal, it's hard to see Medvedev losing. But if Tommy Tommy Paul can find a way to win that match, that that will be a sign that he's not the same player that you just alluded to that played Djokovic, say, in the semis of the Australian last year and made a comeback from 5-1 down to 5-all in the first yeah. set, but then got beat, obliterated in straight sets. So mm. he's had his moments, and it's certainly an opportunity, and I don't think he'll go out there with a lot of negativity, but I just think in the end he's going to just be slightly outclassed. Do you, do you agree with that? Yeah, I do. Um, I, I, I have a similar vibe to you. I'm more than happy to disagree with you, Steve, but I do have a, a similar vibe to you on this occasion in that I think maybe two tight sets go in the way of Daniel. Um, I, I think it's a fair point as well about, about some of these encounters that, that Daniel and Novak don't give you a chance to change the dynamic of the rally. If they're hitting the ball deep and accurately, yeah. what can you do? And that's what Tommy said in his press conference after that Novak semi, because he, he was confronted with that. I think uh, one or two uh, sort of experts, Craig O'Shaughnessy, I remember saying that he should be trying some serve and volleying and trying to change things up during that match with Novak. But he's like, well, what? I can't do that when, when Novak is getting so close to the baseline, you know, during the rally or hitting his returns of serve the way he does. And I, I do think a similar scenario will be occurring tomorrow with, with Daniel. Daniel's playing very well. You mentioned that defeat in Dubai. Tiny asterisk by that one in that I think he had some shoulder issues um, in that tournament. But he's, he seems to be free of those right now. And he seems to be free in general. There, those two matches, though, with, with Runa and Korda from, from Medvedev, there was a bit of a weirdness in some respects about both of them. And you mentioned that just the multiple breaks of serve with Korda. Uh, the Runa one was, there was that debate at the net as well, but it was kind of very difficult to gauge where that match was going because Runa made 27 unforced errors in that first set and two or three less of those. And, and that could have been very different. And there was moments when you thought, okay, Daniel's held serve here. He should be okay. And then suddenly he was losing his serve. And yeah, um, uh, but so this, this again, some chinks of light for Tommy. But but like you, I, I do see Daniel as a warm favorite. No, I agree with you, by the way, what you're saying about the Runa match. There were real opportunities for him. And he was yep. the one I thought the best one was when he had 3-2, 15-40 to go up 4-2 in that first set. It would have made such yeah. a difference. He made yeah. a couple of mistakes on the next two points. Daniel was yeah. rock solid, but, but uh, Runa pressed a bit. And had he broken there and gotten himself a lead, things could have been different. Then in the second set, he had two love with a game point for three love. That was a critical mm -hmm. game. And Daniel ran off four games in a row to go up 4-2 and ran out and won the match. So, yeah, that was very hard fought. But that, again, that's so typical of Medvedev. He's such a – he's he's a very underrated competitor, you know, mm -hmm. because he, he – he, especially when he's in this state of mind, John. He, we're not getting the frantic – Daniel Medvedev that we've seen, you know, sporadically in the past, who's constantly kind of venting to his corner, to his coach yeah. and, and playing the role of the victim. No, he's just going out and playing tennis right now and, and, and competing the way he can when he's at his best. So that's why, again, that I like his chances so much against Tommy Paul, uh, you know, to get to another final here. We haven't seen that from Daniel, have we? I remember there was a, what, at least one, but maybe two instances with, with him really aggressively shouting at his box. Right. And on one occasion, his coach walked out. I remember that in Australia. And yeah. I think that was the last time we saw anything of that level. And, and, and yeah, hats off to him for that. No, I, yeah. And, and he seems to have made a, a pact with himself, if I may say. You know, he, he talked about in Australia that he, he wants to change that side of his court personality. And, and he realizing that he's only hurting himself by getting so angry and wasting that energy and, and that it really is up to him too. The, 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 the idea of, of sort of venting to your coach as if it's your coach's fault. And of course, we, we're going to have Gio Simone come into the picture soon. You know, yeah. he, that's going to help him as well. But I like the idea that, that he's got this commitment to trying to remain calmer on the court and he, that he'll do himself more justice that way too. Cool. So I think Steve and I are in, in agreement. I, I Again, I make Yannick a very, very, very marginal, you know, favourite. But, you know, very few outcomes would surprise me. I mean, I, I think probably a, a two and one win for either player would surprise me. But, you know, I can, you know, two amazingly tight sets or or two, three humdinger sets, as we say in the hum, humdinger is like a roller coaster uh, yeah. scenario. Yeah. 
that will happen there. And I, yeah, the, the one I'm more clear on though is is unfortunately Tommy Paul's sort of semi final run. Uh, as he proved in Australia and also Canada uh, in 2023, I think this will just be a step too far for him. Yeah, but look, we'll we'll see what happens. I I, I feel like it, it would be fun. By the way, I just I I would like to see Medvedev Sinner go at it again, given what happened in Australia and Daniel's disappointment and the exhilaration for J- Yannick winning his first and chance for Medvedev to sort of try to swing the rivalry back in his favor after losing the last four and a chance for Sinner to just keep his unbeaten streak going. That would be fun. Carlos and Medvedev would be fun as well, but I'm afraid it would not be terribly enjoyable for Daniel Medvedev. Right. Because in that, in that instance, I would pick Alcaraz in straight. Yeah, exactly. Um, that would be my concern. I mean, Medvedev maybe can able to bring it like he did in New York last year, if that's the if that's the final. But yeah, it, it feels like a, a sort of a, a three horse race. No disrespects to to Tommy Paul right now, but hey, listen, Tommy, prove us wrong and 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 give us an unbelievable semi final and and yeah. emerge the winner. And I will hold my hands up and say I, I got it wrong. <laughs> well, John, it's been a lot of fun. I always enjoy talking tennis with you. Wonderful, Steve. Thanks for coming on once again. And, and now I'm pretty confident it'll be Grand Slam summertime when we when we touch base. And uh, yeah, but thanks again for coming on. Thank you, John. I, I enjoyed it. Wonderful. If you enjoyed this video, make sure you hit that like button. Don't forget to subscribe and click that notification bell so you don't miss out on all things tennis.